This video includes two crime stories based on actual crimes committed and solved. If we can learn from these two stories, we will be educated instead of just entertained. I like the following quote from Bernard Malamud in The Natural, we have two lives. The life we learn with, and the life we live after that. I always say, ignorance is expensive. So I learn about things that may negatively affect me or my family. With this in mind, I edit and watch my videos as if I am the victim in the story. I watch and look for the warning signs that led up to the crime. Then I consider what I would do to prevent this type of crime from happening to me or to someone in my family. By staying informed and educated about actual life-ending crimes, I can move from being paranoid to being prepared. November 15th, 2013, 9.15 p.m. Dispatchers in Wichita, Kansas, receive an unusual call from the quiet suburb of Valley Center. The caller is 16-year-old Chris Blummel. Yeah, I just got home, and my parents are both in the car. I think they're like both passed out. He said that when he pulled into the drive, he parked back behind where his mom and dad's truck were. He saw that the driver's side door was open. Dispatchers press Chris for more information about this possible medical emergency. My dad keeps on like coughing, and my mom, her head will like bobble up and down. I thought it was a joke at first, and then like they said they had not lived for like 30 minutes. It was just kind of a bizarre thing, and just very unusual how the scene was being described. I was like yelling at him and like trying to wake him up, and not reacting at all. No, nothing at all. I want you to go ahead. Are they breathing? Uh, yeah, my dad feel like coughing. Okay, we do have the permanent in the place on the way, so listen carefully. I want you to go ahead and lay them flat on their back on the ground. They're walking him through, trying to get him to do CPR. Oh, my God. I just opened up the door, and there is blood everywhere. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Chris's parents, 53-year-old Melissa and 48-year-old Roger Blummel, were the quintessential Kansas couple. Melissa started as a bank teller at Chisholm Trail State Bank and quickly rose through the ranks. Melissa was always there. She would do anything you ask her, and she was good at what she did. She was a great employee. Melissa put in long hours at work, but her true passion was a gregarious bobcat salesman, five years her junior, named Roger Blummel. He's the kind of guy that could basically sell anything. Uh, didn't matter what it was. Very friendly, very uh, easy to talk to. Special occasions, her birthday, you would always see Roger come in the bank with a bouquet of flowers. They were the proverbial couple. In the early 1990s, the couple married. Roger left his job selling bobcats and brought Melissa along with him. Roger eventually decided to uh, open up his own business. Uh, so he ventured out and uh, started doing sales on his own. It was uh, mobile contracting supply. Roger and Melissa um, both worked really, really hard. Both came from families with great work ethics. Melissa was promoted to vice president's position. The couple had dreams outside of their careers, too. All of their other friends that had gotten married were able to have kids, and that was always something that they had desired. Melissa wanted a family very, very badly. The couple built a home on some rural property outside of town with plenty of room for children to play. But the baby the Blummels dreamed of never came. They had been trying for a while probably about eight years. It became evident that, that it wasn't going to happen for them. They decided to look into uh, other ways of having a family and started looking through adoption. Not long after Melissa and Roger contacted a local adoption agency in 2001, a social worker called the Blummels with good news. They had found a potential match. The mother's name was Keisha Schauberg. Born in 1978, Keisha Reyes grew up in sprawling Los Angeles, California. While she enjoyed a typical suburban upbringing, 
Keisha was anything but conventional. My grandpa was strict. He always had rules, and Keisha was one that we didn't care about the rules. She began to act out in school, um, not getting the grades that she was getting before. Everything just was declining. Keisha drank beer, she smoked marijuana, she would go party and go to high school parties. At 17, a discovery momentarily put the brakes on Keisha's wild ways. She learned she and her boyfriend were having a baby. Her boyfriend left her soon afterward, and by the time her son Tony was born in 1995, Keisha was a single mom. She was more scared than happy. I remember Keisha saying she didn't want kids yet. During this time in Keisha's life, I believe she was going through a lot of stress and struggles with herself. A few months after she gave birth, she decided to move and she got up and just left. She told me she, uh, she hitched a ride from a trucker and ended up in Missouri. It's in Missouri that Keisha met and fell in love with Chris Shawberg. The couple married soon after, and in 1997, Keisha gave birth to another son, Chris Shawberg Jr. Over the next few years, Chris, Keisha, and the boys bounced across the Midwest. She was a drug user. They were enabling each other. They were staying in a hotel and uh, not working. At one point in time, they were homeless. They were basically living out of a vehicle. Then, one night in 2001, while her four- and six-year-old sons slept in the back seat, Keisha came to a heartbreaking realization. She stated to me that she was not fit to take care of her children. She made the decision to give the boys up. She had seen an advertisement for an adoption agency, and she called this 800 number. The agency told Keisha that they already had a couple waiting, Roger and Melissa Blummel of Kansas. The agency reached out to Roger and Melissa and told them that they had not just one, but two boys who needed a home. I truly believe they would have brought six kids home if that would have been the situation. Melissa and Roger had a lot of love to get. Keisha was sad that she wasn't with Tony and Chris. Keisha was. But she was also happy that the Blumos took them. She had nothing but good things to say about the Blumos. She was very grateful. Back at their new home in Kansas, Tony and Chris Blummel quickly settled into a new life. Melissa took six weeks of maternity leave to stay home with the boys. In her eyes, those were her children from the very beginning. I would say within, you know, a few years of them all living together, it has seemed like they had you know, actually given birth to these two boys. By the time the boys hit high school, the family was a pillar of the Valley Center community. The boys were polite, uh, well-behaved. They just seemed like very uh, respectable young boys. Both Tony and Chris were very active in sports and other activities. By February 2013, Tony was a state champion wrestler, while his younger brother Chris had started making a name for himself on the football field. Melissa was one of those moms that always volunteered to make the dinners for the football players that would do anything to be involved with the boys. In the spring of 2013, the busy Blummel family was facing a new chapter as Tony prepared to graduate. He didn't have any problem in school. He was, you know, a star athlete. He had talked about making plans to go into the Air Force. But on November 15th, 2013, it appears Roger and Melissa may not live to see Tony or Chris's accomplishments. Just six months after Tony's graduation, Chris reports finding his parents unresponsive in their truck. You see this here pulling up? Yeah, they're, they're right behind me. Police still found a pulse and, and you know, signs of life. 
Our victims were code red, and in our world, that means it's a serious injury. Police also find the source of all that blood. They had both been shot in the head. By 2013, Melissa and Roger Blummel had carved out a nice life for themselves and their two adopted sons, Chris and Tony, in Valley Center, Kansas. But on November 15th, Melissa and Roger were found shot outside their home. Chris called 911 and he reported that he had found his parents um, injured. He made a comment on the call about there being blood. Still clinging to life, both Melissa and Roger are rushed to an area hospital. While sheriff's deputies turn to Chris, their only witness. Chris was an acting um, how uh, people would perceive uh, somebody that had uh, discovered their parents shot. The only person that he could think of who could possibly come anywhere close to doing this would be their oldest son, Tony. Police discover the problems began in the spring of 2013, Tony's senior year in high school. Tony was a successful athlete, a successful kid. It wasn't until he began to pretty routinely smoke marijuana. And this is something completely inconsistent with the lifestyle of a state champion wrestler. And the Blummels were having none of it. As Tony got older, he resented, I think, the structure that the family had. He didn't understand why there were curfews or why he couldn't do this and would frequently act out. There had been a history of problems with Tony and Roger and Melissa in that he had shown a tendency to have some issues controlling his temper. They talked about he had punched a hole in their wall. Melissa had become, I believe, afraid of Tony. He was a strong kid. He was an aggressive kid. Things only got worse after Tony's graduation when he was arrested for a DUI. I think the Blummels really wanted Tony to have a career in the Air Force, but that went to shambles when he continued his drug usage. Roger and Melissa are personal friends of mine. They had given Tony several chances to make some changes. It seems that uh, they were unsuccessful in that, and eventually they, Roger made a decision that this was not good for the family to have drugs in the house, so they asked Tony to leave the house. Chris tells responding officers that in September 2013, Tony had taken off to California. But in early November, Tony suddenly returned to town and made plans to reconnect with their parents. Tony had uh, been out to dinner with uh, Roger and Melissa uh, that evening. Now, just hours after meeting with their wayward son, the Blummels are in critical condition. Initially, we were very suspicious of Tony. You know, really, why is he in town? You always start wondering, could it be people closest to them that could be the suspects? Officers take Chris from the crime scene to the station for a more formal interview. Supervision wanted as much information from him as quickly as possible. The decision was made to read Chris's rights. He was asked to explain his activities from that evening, and he declined to, to speak to investigators. Chris's sudden reticence raises a red flag with investigators. Once Chris invoked, we had to look even more strongly at whether or not he was an actual suspect. Chris was described as unusual by both the deputy and the supervisor. They had said that uh, he showed no signs of emotion. The law enforcement officers involved at the time thought, here's this 16-year-old kid that has come back and has found his parents and they've both been shot and they're in their driveway, you know, possibly dying or dead. He was not very emotional at all. Then, there was Chris's unusual behavior on the 911 call. We learned that Chris took about 30 minutes to call 911 before he reported his parents being outside. I'm sure that police immediately thought, ooh, that's a red flag right there. Why did this person not call any sooner? He obviously needs to be ruled out as a suspect before we can widen the net. While police work to track down Chris's whereabouts that evening, detectives and forensic investigators study the crime scene for clues. 
the first substantial piece of evidence that we find on that day is a shell casing inside the vehicle. We identify that the gun that we're looking for is a 25 caliber uh, handgun. One other thing that struck me, at least as I was first being told about the case, was the fact that they hadn't gotten out of the truck yet. It appears as though Melissa opened the door to somebody. It appeared as though it would be somebody that the Blumos would have known. But another detail about the scene soon raises questions about the validity of that theory. We see that the interior door that leads from the garage into the house has been forced open. We go into the house and we start to see things that have been knocked over. And eventually we get into the master bedroom. And in the master bedroom, you can see that uh, drawers have been open. Things have been knocked off of the shelving. Somebody had gone through some stuff. Items had obviously been moved around and placed on the bed. So that area, we knew for sure that people had been in. So we focused our investigation there as far as trying to locate maybe fingerprints or DNA, anything that could maybe give us an idea who had been in there and, and gone through those dresser drawers. At the time, we believed that somebody maybe had come in the house and actually robbed them and Roger and Melissa pulled up in the driveway and may have interrupted a burglary in progress. The idea that the Blummels might have been shot by a stranger opens up even more theories. We know that Roger is a businessman, so we signed somebody to look into there. Did somebody um, have a bad business deal? Was anybody upset with Roger over the sale of something? She worked at a bank and had authority at the bank. Was someone going there to, you know, hold her hostage and make her go in the next morning and rob the bank? To try and narrow their search, Sedgwick County Sheriff's Office investigators head to Wesley Medical Center, where life-saving medical procedures are still underway. Roger and Melissa were in poor condition. One of the things that I was asked to do when I was at the hospital was to try and see if we could figure out their injuries specifically. Both of the gunshot wounds were on the right side of each of their heads. It appeared in that first 12 hours that there was a single shooter Whoever had attacked the Blummels had likely acted alone. Could that trigger man be one of their adopted sons? Or had someone else set their sights on this prominent local family? Nobody knew who the shooter was, what the circumstances were. 24 hours after being rushed to a Kansas hospital with gunshot wounds to their heads, Melissa and Roger Blummel remain in critical condition. For Sedgwick County, Kansas investigators, finding Melissa and Roger's shooter is a top priority. As to a possible motive, a couple of scenarios are on the table. You go through all the different scenarios. You, you start thinking, yes, it could be some sort of botched robbery that happened as they were pulling in. But then you also start looking at the people who are closest to them because anyone could be a suspect. Had Tony or Chris Blummel fired the shots that struck down their adoptive parents? It's important as a law enforcement officer to try and keep an open mind. While police continue working multiple fronts, investigators focus on finding 18-year-old Tony Blummel. It turns out he was looking for them. Tony Blummel uh, was trying to get a hold of law enforcement because he had been told that something happened to his parents. We talked to Tony and asked him to come down to our office building downtown. Unlike his younger brother, Chris, who has invoked his Miranda rights, Tony is eager to speak to Sedgwick County Sheriff's investigators. He was asking a lot of questions. He wanted to know if we had any suspects. Tony is interviewed and acknowledges that he has had a rocky relationship with Roger and Melissa in the past. Tony says that he moved in with a friend, and while he was there, a ghost from his past sent him a message. Keisha, who is Tony's biological mom, has succeeded in making contact with Tony on Facebook. Keisha was living at the time with a female named Sean Hamilton, and they were in a romantic relationship with each other. Tony says that over a decade after she had given him up for adoption, Keisha had turned her life around and now had a seven-year-old daughter, Tony's half-sister. Keisha's off drugs, raising her daughter and doing quite the job. I believe she thought that this was her second chance to be able to be the mother that she couldn't be for the boys. Keisha seemed changed. She seemed happy. 
she just seemed kind of, I want to say carefree almost. Upon my sister Victoria uh, visiting them, she had nothing but glowing reviews as to where Keisha and my half-sister were now. She said that there was a big improvement. Tony tells detectives that in September of 2013, he decided to make the trip out to San Diego, California to reconnect with his birth mother. Keisha was crying when Tony walked in the door. She was just like, oh my God, ecstatic. Tony had told me that he was happy to find his biological mother to finally come in contact with her. Tony says after about six weeks in California, he began to miss his adopted family. So in late October of 2013, he, Keisha, and her daughter drove to Valley Center. He reunited with his adoptive parents on November 15th. They had uh, picked him up at the, at the hotel and they had gone to a Chinese uh, buffet for dinner. Tony said that as part of trying to mend their relationship and make things better, that was one of the reasons that he went to eat supper with Roger and Melissa that night. Tony says that his parents dropped him and his half-sister back at the hotel around 8 p.m. That was the last time he saw them alive. Police are able to verify Tony's timeline with hotel staff. He has an alibi. There's no way to drive from that hotel that he's at to where the Blumels are at. So it's illogical for him to have been the person at the scene. It's obvious that Tony can't be the gunman. But what about the Blumels' other teenage son, 16-year-old Chris? We started to try and verify his alibi. He had gone to a wrestling supper. It was the end of the wrestling season, and they always have a big kind of get-together. He left the supper at 8.45. We take a look at the evidence off of Chris's phone when he made phone calls, and that all seemed to be consistent with what we were told. With both boys ruled out as the shooter, detectives turned to the community for potential clues. Law enforcement checked all the neighbors, all the areas to see if there's any surveillance. They do find a grainy video. We're able to really identify when Chris arrived and when we believe Roger and Melissa arrived. The video quality wasn't the best, but we're able to see headlights. That captured footage seems to verify Chris's story but it also reveals something else. We knew that another car had come in earlier than them. They were headed toward the Blumos. Though the grainy footage makes it impossible for police to identify the make and model of that vehicle, it's clear someone had arrived at the Blumos' home a couple of hours before either Roger, Melissa, or Chris. That was our best lead. This car appears to be involved. Then, on the evening of November 16th, 2013, deputies receive grim news. I get a phone call from the hospital, and they tell me that Melissa has died. Now I'm dealing with truly a homicide, and, uh, uh, you know, one of, one of my friends has died. Melissa had passed, but Roger was still alive. On November 17th, 2013, two days after the shooting, detectives at the Sedgwick County Sheriff's Office receive a much needed break in the case. Sheriff Investigations gets a phone call from the Park City Police Department and they notify us that they have a kid by the name of Dalton who believed he may have some pertinent information on the Blomo homicide. And I said, is he willing to come in and talk to us? And he agrees to come in and, and interview. Dalton starts to lay down his background of his um, ability to get firearms. According to Dalton, on November 13th, 2013, an acquaintance of his, 18-year-old Braden Smith, contacted him via text message. The text message is, I need a gun to do a job. Dalton said that he had turned him down because he was trying to get out of that point of work and that out of that life. Braden was very persistent about it. Contacted him numerous times saying, I know you can get a gun for me. And every time Dalton would say, no, I'm not. Dalton says that when he heard the Blummels had been shot just two days later, he knew that Braden must somehow be involved. 
The case basically turns on that text message and Dalton coming forward. We do backgrounds and try and figure out who Braden Smith is. And we find out that he is part of a, a group of kids up in the valley that have been selling dope. Sedgwick County has a problem with burglaries. Could this possibly be a person who was looking to break into the residence to steal items or find money to support their habit? And Roger and Melissa interrupted that when they came home. At this point, we had made a decision to put up a surveillance on Braden. With Braden now under surveillance, detectives make their next move. Braden is contacted by phone and asked if he would be willing to come in and tell us his side of the story. But prior to coming up to the office for the interview, the surveillance followed him to Chisholm Creek Park. And they watched him throw an unknown object into the pond. On November 19th, 2013, 18-year-old Braden Smith has been brought in for questioning after a Sedgwick County Sheriff's Office surveillance team spied the teen disposing of something in a local pond. Investigators believe that item might be the weapon that had been used to shoot Melissa and Roger Blummel. Roger Blummel had a gunshot wound to his head, um, but he's still alive although his wife passed. We're looking for what we believe to be uh, the murder weapon is a 25 caliber uh, pistol. When Sedgwick County investigators start to press the teen about the shooting, Braden doesn't put up a fight. He came up for our interview and ultimately ended up confessing what had happened. As it turns out, Braden has a connection to the Blummel family, courtesy of their 18-year-old adopted son. We figure out that he's actually a friend of Tony's. The group in Valley Center that Braden and Tony had run with, uh, they were consuming uh, high-grade marijuana. Braden knew that Tony and Keisha had reconnected through social media. He talked about them going out to California to meet up with Keisha. This plan seemed to be that they were going to go out to California and begin to grow marijuana legally. They could stay with Keisha for free. Tony and Brayden stayed with Keisha, myself, and her daughter in San Diego. However, Brayden says that their dreams of a California weed empire wilted within weeks. They got out there and very quickly realized nobody needed them in a dispensary. I lived in a one-bedroom apartment, and there was four adults and a child there. I'm working nobody else's. Brandon and Tony are constantly smoking. Not even three weeks. Keisha is into it. All they do all day is sleep, play video games, and get high. Six weeks. At that point, that was the last straw. I told Keisha that her and the boys, you need to leave. You need to get out. According to Braden, that's when the group decided that they had no other choice but to travel back to Kansas. Braden had shared with us that when they had left California to come back to Kansas, while they were traveling, they had a discussion about getting rid of Roger and Melissa. Tony knew if his parents were gone, he is their legal child, and that he would stand to inherit money. He believed that he would get a significant amount of money. He was going to use it to, you know, get his drug business off the ground. Braden says that he, Keisha, and Tony hatched a plan. Keisha was going to murder the Blummels, and that Braden was going to be there with her to assist. So the plan is hatched for Tony to take them to dinner, and in so doing, then he would allow Keisha and Braden Smith to go back to the home and be there waiting for the Blummels to return. However, as the day for the murder grew closer, Braden says he began to have second thoughts. In Braden's own words, he chickened out. He was told to find somebody to replace him, and so that's when he contacted his friend, Drew Ellington. Braden knew that Drew had aspirations to be a hitman. Braden asked him if he'd be interested in making $1,000, and Drew told him yes. On the 15th, Braden had met up with Drew and given him two firearms. Braden tells police that after that, he has no idea what happened. 
As to what he had tossed in the park pond earlier that day, Braden admits they were firearms, but he claims neither weapon had been the gun used in the shooting. We do find two pistols through searching the, the pond. One of them is a 25 caliber, but we don't know at this point if it's the weapon that was used or not. While detectives await answers from the state lab, police focus their efforts on finding 18-year-old alleged conspirator Andrew Ellington. Once Braden gave us all of his information, we had enough probable cause to arrest Andrew Ellington. We arrested him. He didn't seem surprised. He's then brought up and he confesses uh, to us about his involvement. According to 18-year-old Drew, after being briefed on the plan on November 15th, he and Keisha had driven to the Blummel's house while Tony took his parents out for dinner. Their whole plan was to make this homicide look like Roger and Melissa had interrupted a burglary. They went to the home, we knew from the uh, evidence that they sort of, I'll say, ransacked or gone through uh, certain areas of the home. A little after 8.15 that evening, Drew and Keisha received a phone call from Tony. Tony let Andrew know that he was back at the hotel and Roger and Melissa were headed home. When Roger and Melissa pulled up to the residence, Keisha and Drew basically ambushed him in their truck. Drew was at the driver's side of the vehicle. Keisha was at the passenger side of the vehicle. And when she opened, the passenger side door, she shot Melissa almost immediately. Drew indicated to us that there was a delay of a few seconds and then Keisha leaned in and shot Roger also. Drew says that as soon as the pair arrived back to the hotel, Keisha delivered the news to Tony. Keisha tells Tony it's done, and all Tony does is says, okay, and then that's all the conversation there is about it. Drew says that Keisha got a long sleeve shirt that she wrapped the firearm that she had in and gave that to him along with Melissa's purse and told him that he needed to get rid of them. So Andrew drove out to a residential area and saw an area that had a small little creek to it, and he threw the purse out into the water. A forensic test soon confirms that weapon, and not the two tossed in the pond by Braden Smith, had fired the two bullets that struck down Melissa and Roger Blummer. On November 19, 2013, police charged Drew Ellington with capital murder and aggravated robbery. Now, there are just two more loose ends to tie up. On the 19th, the detectives knock on the door at the hotel. And they locate uh, Tony and Keisha there. While officers escort Keisha to a patrol car, detectives begin digging for answers. Tony's the first person that they talk to. Eventually, they get Tony to confess. He talks about gaining the inheritance. However, Tony says that he's not the only one with a motive to kill. Keisha was the person who spearheaded uh, the decisions in this murder. On November 19, 2013, 18-year-old Tony Blummel tells Sedgwick County Sheriff's investigators that his biological mother, Keisha Shawberg, is the real mastermind behind the conspiracy to murder his adopted parents, Roger and Melissa Blummel. Though both were shot in the head, Roger is still fighting for his life in a local hospital. Part of Keisha's problem was is that she wanted an open adoption. She wanted to be able to continue to have contact with the boys and talk to them. But Roger and Melissa didn't really allow that contact to happen. Their ideology for Roger and Melissa was these two boys had been through a horrible situation. We're adopting them. The former life is over. The new life has begun. Yeah, I feel like Keisha resented Anthony's adoptive parents. She definitely talked about how much she missed her boys, so I, I feel like that probably just festered. Keisha had told Tony that she had even 
gone so far as to drive up into the area where the Blomos live because she was going to kill them so she could get her boys back. It was something that was in her head for a while. I think she wanted the boys. Tony says that once he and his biological mom reconnected on Facebook, Keisha dreamed of reuniting with her younger son, too. But Chris never responded to her messages. Chris wanted nothing to do with her. He didn't want any kind of contact whatsoever. And she thought that that was because of the bubbles. There seemed to be some sort of misguided notion in her part that if she could just get the bubbles out of the way, then Chris was going to come back into her life and the three of them could live happily ever after. Keisha was the mastermind of planning this murder. She's very good at getting people to do what she wants. And she's very good at feeding on people's emotions. But Tony tells police that after the plan was carried out, he realized that he and Keisha had made a terrible mistake. They found out that he was no longer in the will and that he wasn't eligible to get any of the money. Tony later comments in our interviews with him that this whole thing was all for nothing. We talked to Keisha next and explained to Keisha that they've had all these people confess and Keisha denies, 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 and denies. We decided to see if having Tony just come to the interview room door would maybe get some connection with her. And Tony stood in the interview room door and had tears in his eyes and said, Mom, I, I told him everything. Keisha Stone Cold looked at him and said, I don't know what you're talking about. That same day, Keisha and Tony join Braden Smith and Andrew Ellington in the county jail on charges of capital murder and aggravated robbery. Investigators break the news of the arrests to Roger and Melissa's families. I explained to them that Tony was involved. There was a lot of crying, a lot of emotion in that room that morning. Some of the reactions I remember seeing were disgust, just knowing that an adopted son would do something to their adopted parents who had cared for them for so long. Just as one stunning revelation washes over the community, another lands like a punch to the gut. On the 21st of December, Roger dies from his injuries. Roger would have never wanted to have been without Melissa. That's how close they were. Now that the case has become a double homicide, prosecutors amend the charges. They killed two people and this qualified for the death penalty. With the possibility of the death penalty on the table, Keisha and Tony both plead no contest to capital murder and aggravated robbery in exchange for life in prison on May 15th, 2015. Tony wrote an apology letter and after reading it, I just don't grasp the sincerity from Tony. I don't think there's any remorse in Tony. Keisha never took responsibility for her actions. The judge did not grant Tony or Keisha any possibility for parole. The pros for the family was it's finality. It's done. There's no appeal. There's no risk of the case coming back. However, life in prison isn't the end of Keisha's story. When the Snapped production team reached out to her, Keisha, for the first time, made a stunning confession. They learned that Keisha had shared with the production folks that, yes, uh, I killed Roger and Melissa. It really doesn't change anything for me. I knew that back when we solved this case. But even though Keisha took Melissa and Roger's lives, friends, family, and law enforcement believe that the Blummel's legacy still lives on in their younger son. Through all this adversity, Chris went on to have one of the best seasons of his life. He was a star athlete, and obviously now he has moved on with his life and has a career of his own. Chris is doing amazingly well. He's an amazing person. And for what he went through, I think that he should be really proud of himself. Chris living out his life positively 
is a good testament to the Blummel's legacy. It's a hot summer day in Middlebury, Indiana. Middlebury is a uh, quaint little town, village type community in the heart of Elkhart County. Very rural community. Crime doesn't happen in Middlebury. It's the type of place where you could probably keep your door unlocked um, and not have to worry about a thing. On August 5th, 2005, Middlebury police receive a 911 call from a woman who is worried about her sister, 41-year-old Barbara Kime. It was reported she hadn't showed up for work, she hadn't been answering any calls. Barbara was a nurse at Elkhart General Hospital, a very diligent person, very responsible. It was very unusual that she would have not shown up to work. The sister says Barbara has joint custody of a five-year-old son, but unexpectedly, she missed a custody exchange that day. She failed to pick up her son from her ex-husband's residence. From the information that we're receiving, this was totally out of the norm for Barbara. She was very concerned that uh, something uh, bad had happened at that point. The caller gives the address of the home Barbara shares with her 17-year-old daughter, Hannah. Police respond to the address and note that a red Pontiac van registered to Barbara Kime is parked outside. The front door is unlocked. Our initial entry into the house was just to determine that nobody was hurt, injured, unconscious. The place is eerily quiet. Hannah and Barbara were both gone. There was no forced entry. There was no signs of struggle. There was no damage that would lead us to assume that there was any foul play. They were looking for any kind of unusual signs, uh, unusual activity, missing items, just trying to piece together what may have happened. Then, the patrol deputies spot something that could mean trouble. Barbara's purse was there. Billfold was outside of the purse laying next to it. It appeared to be missing money, credit cards, debit cards, things like that. It's not very common for someone to just walk away from their life and leave everything behind, including their ID. That's very alarming. Barbara Jo Neff had always lived in Elkhart, Indiana. Barb was born on May 1st, 1964. I know she had one brother and four sisters. She had a very significant, close-knit relationship with her sisters. Barbara was a nurturer, always caring for those around her. Everybody said she was a well, wonderful, wonderful person. Her compassionate spirit eventually led her to pursue a career in nursing. When Barbara met fellow Elkhart native Alex Stone, an aspiring minister, the two quickly fell in love and married. Soon, the couple had a little girl, Hannah Lynn Stone. Hannah was born March 22nd, 1988. Her mom, she was happy. Sadly, over the next two years, the couple drifted from each other. Barbara and Alex amicably divorced in 1991 and agreed to share joint custody of Hannah. Five years later, Barbara seized a second chance at happiness when she married Robert Kime, though Hannah didn't always agree with her stepfather. Robert was a deputy for the Elkhart County Sheriff's Department, him being a cop. He was very stern on Hannah. In 2000, Barbara and Robert welcomed a son into the world. By then, Hannah was nearly a teenager. Hannah absolutely adored her little brother, but as much as she loved her little brother, she would tell me all the time, my mom loves him more than she loves me. Barbara reassured Hannah she loved both her children equally, and the little family settled into a new normal. But then, Barbara and Robert's relationship took a turn, and before Hannah entered high school, the couple filed for divorce. I don't know what really honestly led to the divorce of her husband. Um, I just know that Hannah had told me at one point that they had to move to a very tiny two-bedroom apartment in Middlebury. 
Once again, Barbara became a single working mother. Barb was a nurse on the maternity floor at Elkhart General Hospital. She probably delivered thousands of babies. She had a huge impact on a lot of people's lives. Barbara was also an active member of the Brenneman Memorial Missionary Church. Barb was pretty well involved, and she did have support of the patrons of Brenneman. Hannah went to a couple of youth group stuff there. Hannah's dad, Alex, was a Methodist minister at another church. At her last school, Hannah was known as the preacher's daughter. So when she entered high school in her new hometown of Middlebury, she decided to rebel. Freshman year in high school, she had transferred, and she kind of meshed in with our group of friends because even though we were emo or even goth, she kind of found us as a family, and she blended in very well. Hannah, who had struggled with feeling loved, finally found a group she connected with. We would just honestly go out driving around, blasting music along the back country roads, speeding, you know, typical teenager stuff. We just thought we were the coolest kids on the block. Despite the teen rebellion, Barbara loved Hannah unconditionally. She loved her mom, but you could tell there was kind of like this invisible wall type deal. She didn't have the same mother-daughter relationship that most mothers have with their daughters. But they had their moments. They had their good moments. Barb, she was trying exceptionally hard, you know, between working tons of hours, taking care of a five-year-old, trying to deal with Hannah, keeping her in line. It wasn't the easiest life for Barbara, but she loved her kids and she had her faith. It seemed like a new beginning. But one hot day in August 2005, both Barbara and Hannah vanished from their home. Any person has the right to disappear if they want to and not be contacted if they don't want to. I've done investigations like that before where people have walked away and I've made contact with them and they've said, I'm all right, I just want some time by myself. I don't want family to contact me. And I've dropped it from there. But you never want to just assume that everything's okay. You want to investigate until you find out that that person is okay. While searching the apartment, police note every detail, not knowing what might become relevant. There were some cigarette butts that were in a glass in the living room. The cigarette butts seemed to stand out in the otherwise neatly kept home. Investigators check in with the original 911 caller. Barbara's sisters pointed out Barbara detested cigarette smoke. Barb hated smoking, you know, her being a nurse. She knows how bad it is for you, and she would not allow cigarettes in that apartment. We weren't sure if those could have been handed some friends of hers. Well, this is kind of not at home at that time. We didn't know. At that point, there was some suspicious activity, but nothing that screamed out that there had been foul play. Without a search warrant, investigators cannot process the apartment further, but they do what they can. We did attempt to go ahead and put on an ATL and attempt to locate with her description. The daughter was missing. Mother was missing. We started thinking that there's more to this than just a missing person. Everything's not right. You know, after a, a few hours or, or overnight, sometimes you don't know. We're putting a vehicle description out there, talking to uh, hospitals, other departments. Seeking witnesses, police also question neighbors. We did have an officer go out there and try to, you know, get information of what they heard during the time period that Thursday night to Friday morning. And there was one gentleman that said that he heard something going on in the hallway or in, in, in the apartment below. They heard scuffling, they heard yelling, and they thought it was just a domestic fight. Now detectives worry that something sinister happened inside the apartment. As an Indiana summer heats up, relatives are worried about 41-year-old Barbara Keim and her 17-year-old daughter, Hannah. The call came out as a welfare check, uh, which means usually to check on a person they haven't been able to contact. Responding investigators have found cigarette butts in a glass inside their apartment. Barbara's sisters 
they found that to be unusual because she didn't allow smoking in her home. And Barbara's purse was lying on her bed. It was open. Her billfold was outside of the purse. The credit card was missing and some cash was missing from her wallet. When somebody leaves behind any means of getting through the day, their money, billfold, ID, that's alarming in itself. When you have red flags like that, you want to err on the side of caution. You have to carry everything to the fullest to make sure that person's all right. Neighbors have reported hearing sounds of a struggle coming from Barb and Hannah's apartment. They did not want to call the police department because they don't want to bother anybody with it. Smaller towns, the people tend not to call the police because they don't want to cause any ruckus or report something that's not necessary or, or waste our time. I've told people millions of times, you know, hey, this is our job. Call us anytime. Let us decide whether or not something should be done about it. Middlebury police ask surrounding agencies to be on the lookout for Barbara and Hannah. And Middlebury deputies keep a watch on the home. Checked on the residents a few times during the night, looking for any kind of movement. Anybody who come back and did not observe any. We were still interviewing people, friends, relatives, and things of that nature. From the first of an investigation into someone being missing, we want to try to identify the last persons that would have had information on those folks that's verifiable. As another stifling August day begins, Barbara's ex-husband, Robert Keim, contacts Middlebury Police. Mr. Kime was a law enforcement officer at that time, and he called us with concerns. Robert confirms that Barbara was supposed to pick up their five-year-old son from his house the previous day, but she never showed up. From what we had been told, that's, this is not normal behavior. Robert tells police he's very worried. We knew that they were friends, even though they were no longer together. He gave us her cell phone number to try to contact her and all this, and he was very helpful in the investigation. I don't believe that he was ever a suspect in the crime. Next, police question Alex Stone, Barbara's first husband and Hannah's father. Alex says he doesn't know where Barbara or Hannah are. The worried father agrees to file an official missing persons report for his missing teen daughter. But without more evidence or a witness coming forward, there's little more police can do. Then, less than 24 hours after the initial 911 call that first sent police to Barbara's apartment, investigators receive another call from one of Barbara's neighbors who say they just witnessed a new development in the case moments earlier. There was uh, some folks in the neighborhood who had observed a couple of people who were taking out trash to the dumpster. The neighbor explains they also saw the people load boxes into Barbara's red van. They described the female as dark hair and, and heavy and a uh, man that was with her as a thin dude neighbors reported them taking one of the vehicles that did belong to Barbara. Patrol deputies rush back to the apartment they checked earlier to investigate the new lead. We gained entry to the apartment by a family member and found the house had been cleaned. The cigarette butts were gone. Her purse and the keys of the vehicle were all gone. Why would someone clean the home and then take the van? Authorities believe it may have been an attempt to get rid of evidence. But evidence of what? Somebody had came back later and cleaned up the apartment stuff to try to hide any evidence. And we didn't know we really had a crime until that point. And things started to kind of speed up after that. It was definitely escalating. I mean, this is really serious. You know, what we're working here is we're pretty sure we got a kidnapping, abduction type situation. Investigators update the be on the lookout alert to include Barbara's red van, as well as Hannah's vehicle. The new witness statements also allow authorities to subpoena Barbara's cell phone and financial records. 
we were able to contact the phone company and they were able to give us a detailed record of times and places that the phone had been used within that period of time. There was nothing there. There hadn't been any activity. Barbara's cell phone use had been steady before she was reported missing. Then it stopped abruptly on August 4th. I decided to go ahead and get a hold of her bank and see had any transactions had occurred on her account in the last 24 hours. My chief was able to get a bank manager to come in on, uh, on, on a Saturday, I believe, and, and pull some records, and we found some ATM withdrawals. According to the bank records, someone withdrew the money from a teacher's credit union in Middlebury. The transaction was made shortly after 10 p.m. on August 4th, one day before Barbara was reported missing. Barbara's records reveal another ominous fact. She almost never took money out of ATMs. First thing you think is a kidnapped and being taken to ATMs, forced to uh, withdraw money. A lot of ATM machines do have surveillance, so that's easy to find out if she's withdrawing her own money or if somebody else is withdrawing money. Unfortunately, getting the surveillance video will take time. This happened on a Saturday, and we were doing all this on a Saturday when things were closed. So we were trying to get some information compiled and brought together to continue with more ways of finding her. Bank records also show another suspicious transaction on the day Barbara was reported missing. The police were able to determine that a check had been cashed from her uh, TCU account in the amount of $800. The check was made out for vehicle repair. And that check had been made payable to Aaron McDonald. One hot Indiana summer, after Barbara Keim and her teenage daughter Hannah were reported missing, Middlebury, Indiana police trace a check cashed on Barbara's account to a man named Aaron McDonald. Police went looking for Aaron McDonald uh, to ask him questions about where he came into his money. We were very fortunate with Mr. McDonald. We had contact before on minor issues, and we were able to locate him. And I think Officer Jared found him in a later friend's house somewhere outside of town, but brought him back in. And I think that's where things really started to turn was when we brought Aaron in. On August 7, 2005, at the Middlebury Police Department, investigators questioned the 17-year-old. Aaron explains he knows Hannah through church and school. Aaron McDonald, he went to church too. You know, I have a couple friends that, you know, just said, you know, oh, he was in my youth group with me. He was such a great kid, and he was. Aaron insists he knows nothing about the disappearance of Barbara or Hannah. He claims he didn't even know they were missing. He explains the check by saying that he and his friend Nate recently did some transmission work on Barbara's van. Authorities don't buy it. We knew Mr. McDonald was not a mechanic licensed in any way. We found it highly suspicious. Investigators ask Aaron to provide contact information for his friend, Nate. Moving quickly in hopes of finding the mother and daughter before it's too late, police track down and interview Nate within 20 minutes. His mom was there and I do remember that he was very nervous. Nate was kind of Aaron's alibi, but when they had interviewed Nate, he said, no, Aaron was definitely not with me at this time, at this date. Investigators press him for more. He thought harm was going to come to him by, by talking to us and giving us the truth. What is the truth that Nate is so afraid to tell? His mom really encouraged him to tell us what happened for the benefit of Barbara and to find out if she's safe or not. So that's when then Nate came forward and told us what he had heard. Nate claims that Aaron asked him to lie about receiving the $800 for automotive work. 
He adds that Aaron told him about a crime, one involving Barbara's daughter, Hannah, and Hannah's boyfriend, 18-year-old Spencer Krimpitz. Police know Spencer from previous run-ins. He would walk around downtown in a black trench coat and just cause alarm in a small town. The way he dressed, the way he walked, his demeanor, he wanted to make a statement. He wanted to intimidate people. Spencer Krebitz just had a very, I, I, I hate to say the word, an evil look in his eye. Hannah had met Spencer a few months earlier at a place called The Post. The Post basically was a place for teenagers to hang out. They always had like local bands playing there. They had like a little kitchen cafe type deal down in the basement. And Hannah was hanging out with a group of friends at The Post and she had met Spencer. And a couple weeks later, she tells me, hey, there's this guy, he's gonna take me out on a date and everything. And I'm like, oh cool, what's his name? And she was like, oh, it's Spencer. When I met Spencer, he just kind of offered me a cigarette. And I said, no, thank you, I don't smoke. He's like, why? We're all gonna die anyways. Doesn't matter. Barbara Kai had real concerns about Spencer, that the subject of their arguments uh, had largely centered on Hannah's relationship with Spencer Krebitz. Hannah changed, and everybody knew it. She kind of became withdrawn from our group of friends, and Barb was concerned that Hannah was dating a guy that was a couple years older than her, and she felt like he was kind of steering her down a path that Barb didn't quite agree with. She just had a bad feeling about the guy. Did not like him, didn't like his attitude towards her, towards Hannah. Barb didn't want Hannah to be with Spencer anymore. Um, she had forbade them from seeing each other. But the warm freedom of summer brought the teens closer than ever. Hannah knew she could get away with it during the summer. Nate claims that this is why Barbara Keim has disappeared. Finally, Nate reveals to police what Aaron allegedly told him. He said that Aaron and Spencer and Hannah had taken Barbara against her will out into a cornfield and shot her. It's a stunning new claim, one that rattles authorities. I remember throughout the initial part of the investigation thinking maybe these kids took Barbara and forced her to give them money. And then all of a sudden, the oh wow factor kicks in that this is a homicide investigation. But why would a teen girl, her boyfriend, and a friend from church murder the girl's mom? We have the same crimes as the bigger cities, just on a smaller scale. You know, theft and burglary and everything else. But it's definitely rare to have a murder there. As Middlebury authorities question Nate, Police in the nearby town of Goshen are helping out on the search for Barbara and Hannah. When we came to work that night, Middlebury gave us a description of the vehicles looking for Barb Kime, and then we got license plate numbers too. That muggy evening, Goshen officers make a crucial discovery in the parking lot of a motel. When I drove in there, I saw both vehicles immediately. The plate numbers were identical to what we had been given. One of them had a broken out window. Plus there was a bunch of vomit on the side of one of the vehicles. Authorities cannot waste a single moment in determining why those vans are there. The Goshen Police Department decided they wanted to go ahead and make entry because it was some distance between our town. And it was a good 20 minutes, which can make a difference. I got on the radio and I called anybody who was available to come help me. I got three or four guys right away and we put people at the exits and entrance of the hotels. And then we went inside to the front desk, asked if Spencer had registered there. Two days after Barbara Keim and her daughter, Hannah Stone, were reported missing, investigators believe they have tracked Hannah's boyfriend, 18-year-old Spencer Krimpitz, to a motel in Goshen, Indiana.
Ocean police suspect Spencer might be armed, so they hope to surprise him. We entered unannounced and quickly, because we don't know who's on that room. The officers find two people inside. We're both laying in bed, and we announced ourselves, please, no resistance at all. Officers quickly identify the two as Spencer Krimpitz and Hannah Stone. Hannah or Spencer didn't say a word, didn't ask why we were coming in there, didn't ask why they were being handcuffed or nothing. Authorities transport the suspects to the Goshen Police Department for questioning. Twelve miles away in Middlebury, investigators seek to re-interview Aaron McDonald. But before they find Aaron, his conscience gets the better of him. Aaron had called me at five o'clock in the morning on Sunday and asked me if I would come to his house in Middlebury. I walked in and he was crying and I hugged him and I said, what's the matter? And, and he said, uh, you know, he, he said, Spencer killed somebody, killed a lady. He goes, and so I was, I was with him. And immediately I went in, I went into like a shock. He wanted to leave. He said, take me to your house. And um, I figured that that wasn't a good idea. Shortly thereafter, was maybe 15, 20 minutes, the police came to the door. Patrol deputies take Aaron into custody and transport him to the Goshen Police Department, where Hannah Stone and Spencer Krimpitz are being held. Now that Aaron knew that the other two were found, he came clean and told more of the truth. Aaron was more of a follower, I believe. He was just a loner, somebody that wanted to be a part of something and be with people. Aaron had a good childhood, he had a good family. But as he progressed through elementary school, he started falling behind and he struggled. And he'd come home after school and he would be sad and cry because the kids said he was stupid. He wanted so much to be accepted. He wanted to have friends. I think that played a lot into when he finally was accepted by Spencer. You know, people like Spencer, they prey on people like Aaron. Aaron tells investigators that Hannah told him she was having problems with her mother, and Hannah was ready to end those problems. Aaron said that Hannah had planned to have her mom killed. They had came over to Aaron's house prior to going to get Mrs. Kime, and they were smoking marijuana with Aaron, and they kept asking Aaron to go with them. There was a plan to secure a gun, and Aaron McDonald was able to secure a gun from someone he knew. I think they were holding out to Aaron, hey, you know what, she's got a lot of money. Aaron went for money because in Aaron's mind, if they said that he could get $400, they'd give him 400 I mean, he, he would have thought, well, you know, that's like a million bucks to him. I mean, it's not right, and I'm not defending him, but he went to take money. Aaron tells police that the three of them drove to Barbara's apartment and Hannah came up with a way to get inside without a struggle. Hannah Stone knocked on the door so that her mother would not be suspicious and Barbara answered the door for Hannah. Hannah was at the door and Hannah said that she needed to get some clothes. At that point, Spencer and Aaron, who had been hiding near the door, pounced, jumped on her. When they jumped on her, she had made some screaming noises. Spencer tied her up with duct tape, taped her mouth. While they're doing that, Aaron's going through the house to try to find some money. And uh, they get her to have a card. That's when Aaron and and Spencer went ahead and took physical force of Mrs. Kime. Then they proceeded to take her out to her vehicle. They put her in the van and drove around. Hannah stayed behind. Her purpose of staying behind was so that neighbors wouldn't be alerted. 
they were concerned that someone might have heard or may come looking for. According to Aaron, the men followed Hannah's plan to get cash from Barbara. They went to various ATM machines to access her account in efforts to get money. Aaron claims that Spencer then began driving as if he were scouting for a specific place. Spencer drives around, Aaron says, oh, quite a bit. Keeps her driving around, and finally they go to Napanee in Kosciuszko County. They were just probably a mile or two uh, past the uh, county line in Kosciuszko County. According to Aaron, Spencer parked near a field and pulled Barbara out of the van. She was wondering where she was. Like she was begging and pleading Spencer, asking where she was. Aaron says that Spencer began walking Barbara into the field. Aaron had started to walk in. He had a bad feeling. He got some both feet. Went back to the van and waited. Aaron hears a gunshot. Spencer comes back, and Aaron said he was growling like a like a lion or something. And he was growling, and he had blood all over his face and all over him. Investigators tell Aaron he needs to take them to the site where Barbara was allegedly shot. He had given information to police that um, the body was located in a cornfield. Um, he wasn't quite sure, but he felt he could um, map it out if they drove him. And so they put him in a car. We left Elkhart County and crossed over into Kosciuszko County. He had described a bridge of some sort near where he believed the murder took place. And as we crossed over a little bridge, he had indicated that this was the location. As temperatures and tensions rise in rural Indiana, Aaron McDonald leads police to what he claims is the location of the body of missing nurse Barbara Keim. The police officers, at his instruction or direction, went into the field. As you got closer, there certainly was the unmistakable presence of a figure that was on the ground. She was on her back. The body will later be identified as that of Barbara Keim. From that point forward, all of the work went back into, how did we get here? To get answers, police interrogate Spencer. Confronted with Aaron's statement and the discovery of the body, Spencer confesses and finally tells investigators everything, including the parts Aaron did not see. They take her to a cornfield. Spencer put her on her knees, and Spencer was behind her. Spencer tells her he's going to kill her, says to her, do you want to pray? He asked her if she knew the Lord's Prayer. She said she did, and he said, no, well, you better start saying it. That had to be a very terrorizing situation to have a considerable amount of time with people knowing that you're not coming out of this situation alive. She shakily said the Lord's Prayer, but didn't say amen at the end. And he said, you're not going to say amen? And then when she says amen, he fires a shot in the back of her head. And was fascinated by watching her body fall to the ground. My chief, when he came out of the interview with Spencer, yeah, he was like, wow, that, that kid scares me. He said, that, that boy's evil. But the plan to murder Barbara Kime came from her daughter, Hannah Stone. Both Spencer and Aaron said that Hannah was the mastermind behind this plan. Barb didn't like Spencer and didn't like them being together. So Hannah was just, you know, we can solve all this by just getting rid of my mom. So they concocted this idea to get rid of Barb. Investigators confront Hannah Stone about her role in the death of her mother. At first, she denies everything. She didn't know anything, and didn't know what was going on. Um, like she was trying to play the victim. I don't know what happened. Eventually, Hannah admits she was there at the apartment. But she claims it was Spencer's idea to rob her mother, and she never thought he would kill her. 
Prosecutors decide to charge Hannah, Spencer, and Aaron equally. Based upon the evidence, we determined that there were three charges, criminal confinement, conspiracy to commit murder, and murder. And so all three were charged with the same offense. They all initially pled not guilty. News of the arrests leaves the small community of Middlebury reeling. Currently, we have in custody on preliminary charges of murder three individuals. I heard it over the news, and I just dropped to my knees, and I screamed to the point where I was I was hoarse. Like, I, I couldn't understand why, what, you know, how. At the arraignment, Spencer Crimpett seems to enjoy the attention. I will never forget seeing Spencer. That image will be stuck in my head forever. He was transported from the jail to the courthouse. And the way that he came out of that car, he stuck his tongue out. And his tongue, I felt like it came all the way down to his chin almost. His eyes were glazed over. He just looked like he was possessed by the devil. It was one of the scariest things I've ever seen. I was shocked. Nothing happens like that in Middlebury. In early 2006, Aaron McDonald pleads guilty. Aaron McDonald was given an opportunity to enter a plea to the three charges, and he gets 65 years for his participation. Did he pull the trigger? No, but he was as responsible as the trigger puller because of his engagement and his activity. I don't know Spencer, and I don't know Hannah, but I know Aaron. I, just, I can't wrap my head around how the kid I know and love ended up in that situation. You know, I just, I, I, I can't figure it out. On March 10th, 2006, Spencer Krimpitz pleads guilty to murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and criminal confinement while armed with a deadly weapon. He said that he basically pulled the trigger, killed Barb Keim to please the girl he loved. On March 30th, 2006, Spencer Krimpitz is sentenced for his crimes. I do remember at his sentencing that he said, if you're going to give me life in prison without parole, then you might as well just give me the death sentence. But the judge made the determination that it would be life without parole. Spencer decides to give himself a death sentence. Spencer committed suicide. You know, he took the coward's way out. He decided to take someone's life, and then you're going to take your own life because you can't deal with the repercussions? No. In March 2006, Hannah Stone also pleads guilty to the same charges as Spencer. Hannah Stone, through her counsel, we gave her an offer that she could enter a plea of guilty uh, to the three offenses and face a stipulated sentence of 100 years. None of this happens without Hannah Stone. Because Hannah Stone is ultimately the one who made the decision to kill her mother. There's no question about that. She is someone who committed a horrendous act, and you can't help but wonder what happened that she could have such an expression of hatred for the woman who gave her life. She knew Spencer was going to kill her mother. She knew what she was doing, and her mom's not here because of her actions and the actions of Spencer. Hannah's callous actions also left a young boy, her little brother, heartbroken and motherless. The son cries. The son would wake up in the middle of the night crying, Mommy, Mommy, right after the killing happened. I just want to end this by expressing my condolences to the family of Barbara Kime. I'm sorry that uh, Barbara was taken from them. I know the pain that they've suffered is certainly a, a very hard um, her loss. Barb may not have thought she had such a huge impact, you know, because she was such a humble person, but um, I think if she had seen how many people hung, actually turned out at her viewing and funeral, she would have seen a lot of people did care. A lot, a lot of people did care and love her. She was just this devout Christian woman who just loved helping other people out. I feel like the community definitely lost an angel 